We're uh, we're here. We're you here. Know, we drink beer. Get used to it. You know. You know. I gotta say. I gotta say. You know what I can't deal with? A deck of cards that's been glued together. <laughs> and with that. Welcome to the Genus Livestream, something that we do every Sunday. It's super informational because we're awesome and you should listen to everything we say and definitely do it. That's right. Spread around the genus-isms, uh, definitely ask Corbs. Um, so yeah, tune in, smash that like button right away, do it. It's the first thing that you do because we always like to smash right off. Uh, but up 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 um, the, the order of the show kind of goes with we talk about some Genus Brewing news right at the front, um, things going on here in the tap room or anything notable that we notice in the general beer community. Uh, one thing I didn't mention last week is I did see that Stone's main, uh, whatever that city in, um, not in San Diego, but just north of it. Uh, Escondido. Escondido is, uh, is closing that. down after a bit of a legal issue Ooh. with their landlord. So they said, hey, COVID year, mandatory shutdowns. We shouldn't have to pay full rent. And the landlord said... You should. You're a big business. Suck it up. And Stone said, you know, put a lot of money into litigation and then finally decided to close down that location. So the, the iconic Stone location that everyone loves going to is no more. That's, um, I mean, it, it sounds right for the company and the attitude that they take on things. Uh, definitely. That's a little bit sad for beer history, but, uh, you know, yeah. they're going to be all right. They They'll survive. All right. Yep. Uh, Mark Daniel, says we went there. <clears throat> yeah, Daniel. I'm gonna say it's not Attack on Titans. It's actually just the HBO show uh, or DC show, depending on when you watch it. Titans, the live action Teen Titans. Yeah. Although, I, I mean, you probably at one time should watch Attack on Titans. I've only watched the first two episodes, and I didn't. Yeah. I didn't get hooked enough to draw me in. I did and finish I season know. five of uh, My Hero Academia, though. I know you bastard. You like. <laughs> took me out of my watch order I'm like where is it <laughs> couldn't find it for a minute uh it's all right it's pretty easy to navigate it is all right it is. and other genus brewing news uh we have a passion fruit celsi that we just put on right Ooh, what passion passion fruit so we, we put on put dragon on fruit measure? uh dragon the pink one dragon uh, i don't know you made it which one uh, you guys put it on it's on the label and you expect me to read we put on a huckleberry one Uh, oh. I didn't know, I uh, didn't think it was passion fruit because dragon fruit. people might be allergic. It, it probably is dragon fruit. Uh, Matt Weiser, I did not check that one, so do that before trying it. This one. Mm, that is pretty. I, I haven't got to try that yet. It's dragon fruit. Um, we also, uh, our Ask Corbs video is out, the one that people have been asking uh, asking about a bunch. If you didn't see our Ask Corbs video, go check it out. If you've got questions on Ask Corbs, do not ask them on the live stream ever again, or Tim will punch you in the schnoz. All up in the schnoz. I will, I will punch you in the genes. Genuses. Genomics. In the genuses. Actually, <laughs> speaking of genuses, because it reminds me of... Uh, I was at Natural 20 last night. Delicious. Go go have some beer, some food. And they gave you a little ticket for their raffle. And it says address on there. And I expect them to know me. So I says genus rhymes with P underscore. Just because it's definitely not what you're thinking at all. Thank you very much. And you're going to have to play hangman to like get it. But take your mind out of the gutter. And I'm pretty sure their mind will be in the gutter. And then that will be funny. Yeah. That, that was a great story. Prenus. I mean, exactly. That, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's actually a, uh, a genus. Perfect. Uh, so, it, it is. It's real. Uh, also, Chumbly, I'm not talking to you for the rest of the day, but that's pretty cool. Adam <laughs> Chumbly commented on there that he was on a Zoom call with Dick Cantwell. If you don't know who Dick Cantwell is, uh, he's an amazing brewer. Uh, he's a 10 millionaire. Yeah, well, he got paid a lot he of got money. Part of ten million dollars for uh, for a brewery sellout that he didn't want to do, but he makes a lot of really really good pumpkin beers. And if you want to make a pumpkin beer, a person you should follow is Dick Cantwell. And he makes uh, them well. 
in terms of other stuff we're trying to get our, our, our uh, Instagrams more popping so go on our Instagrams uh, give a shout out to all the good effort that uh, our new Ryan uh, named Harry has been doing um, and I don't is there anything else we did Any uh, new, new and notables this week oh we put on the consummate crisp cider from uh, trail breaker that Ooh, is yeah, stupid delicious like stupid delicious on there you gotta you gotta stop for a little bit more I'm gonna turn off that uh, whirring sound Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, but uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of it. Because we just, uh, we've talked about pretty much everything that we got going on. Well, I guess we haven't talked that uh, we got the Saison Brett coming up. That one's going to be really fun. Made up uh, both Saison and Brett. Uh, definitely. It has both of those things in there. A blend of a few different ones, actually. I think there's two different Saison strains and maybe three different forms of Brett. So we're really getting after it, getting that uh, funkification on. Oh, Daniel does, does have a good point. Uh, I did say that we, you could ask about Ascorbs. It just costs $20 now. Yes. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, um, all right. I think that's good with our Genus Brain News, which means we're going to go on to our beer of the week. Beer, beer of the week, the week. Bum, 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 beer, beer of the week, week. yeah. Uh, and this week's beer of the week, speaking of high ABV beers, ABV beers which is going to be kind of our topic of centralism, centrism, centricism. Centrism. This today is going to be a Belgian Dark Strong. Belgian Dark Strong is a really fun um, beer to brew and probably a very underrated style. Uh, for me, it's one of the best winter warmer E styles, kind of a callback to last week, um, just naturally in its own right because it's boozy. It's naturally a little bit sweet, uh, but also it doesn't overall sit on, it doesn't sit on the palate as heavy as, you know, a big boozy 1.035 FG barrel aged stout with cinnamon in it. I, I mean, you, you, he's saying that when we have a... We do one have one of those way, in the back. <laughs> no, two, five, Belgian Strong Dark on tap right now. 1.025. That's yeah. not 1.035. It's not. Uh, I will say if that it's actually... It's 1.025. It's out of the style guidelines because as I'm looking at right here, the, fi the FG range is 1.010 to 1.024. Oh, I will also say on this that uh, you can have a very big perceived sweetness uh, coming from a few techniques of doing it uh, without actually having the sugar in there too. Yeah. So even if it finishes down at the 1.010 range, it should perceive sweet. Um, and we'll get into that in, uh, in, in, in the down in, the road in area. A minute. Overall impression. A, oh, wow. Yeah. We're taking the glasses off <laughs> a dark, complex, very strong Belgian ale. It didn't even print the L's. <laughs> just skipped with, over it <laughs> with, Oh man. With a delicious, Oh man, of malt richness, dark fruit flavors, and spicy elements. Complex, smooth, and dangerous. And I actually really like that last word on there, dangerous. And uh, that's what I find a lot of these beers to be. That and, beer is so dangerous. Yeah, that being what I take that to be as a beer that is so delicious and easy to drink, you want to drink far more than you should and you don't realize that you have once mm. you have <laughs> uh, appearance yeah. in this is going to be deep amber uh, to deep coppery brown in color uh dark in blank context uh, implies more <laughs> it's skipping all the else implies more deeply uh golden a huge sense of moosey so moosey being like a that thick foam uh persistent cream to light colored head can be uh, clear to somewhat hazy, so definitely not a super hazy beer. Uh, when we're talking about the color, the SRM range is 12 to 22, and 12 is that bottom end of the gold color, the top end of the amber color. Amber kind of goes all the way to 18, and then 22 is anywhere from dark amber to almost a little bit brown. Um, some porters are going to be 22 as well, but that just has to do with the um, uh, presence or uh, lack thereof of roasted malts. And so it can be very, very dark without being in that black world because it shouldn't really have roasted malts uh, in any major extent. And, and I'm going to go along with that and also say that it shouldn't have black characteristics to it. It shouldn't have black color characteristics to that. Uh, when you're getting dark onto this, you're actually getting dark through a lot of Maillard reactions, 
whether that be in the malt itself, your boiling uh, schedule for it, or using Belgian candy sugar, where a lot of this color is going to come from, it's actually going to be Maillard reactions, and it's going to be just a different color of quality, not getting into malt, that super dark black roasted malt character on that, uh, which is good. I mean, you know, you shouldn't do that. It, it shouldn't be roasty. Shouldn't be roasty toasty. That is just a beautiful color. I got jealous of your pink, so. Yeah, hey. No you idea. know, you should be. No, we have two be. in our pinks. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, Earthbound again. Yes, I will 100% agree with you. St. Bernardus 12 is amazing. That is actually a great, great, great example of this style of beer. Uh, Alan Newmeyer, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, also, uh, it's been a while since I played Earthbound. Oh, man. Be a good one to go. Is that, go back. I mean, is that on Switch? It might be downloadable. Yeah, Earth. That was such a great game. I remember in Nintendo Power, they uh, sent one out that was Scratch and Sniff for Earthbound, and it was <laughs> just mostly horrible, absolutely horrible. But it was so cool. You're like, oh, I can smell Earthbound. No, I wish I didn't. <laughs> I wish if you I told didn't. me this is bubblegum, I wouldn't argue with you. I mean, you know, it's kind of got that quality. Uh, Aroma on a Belgian Dark Strong. Um, we're probably going to skip most of the actual reading off the BJCP uh, guidelines, but Belgian Dark Strong <laughs> should have um, really rich dark fruit notes. Um, they can have a little bit of spice, uh, and usually that's phenolics from natural yeast production. Um, they can have a little bit of toffee, but again, they're not overly toffeefied. Uh, basically, they're sweet without all the things that directly remind you of sweetness. Scoot, 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 scoot. Uh, and I will actually say that some of the aroma on Belgian Strong Darks, uh, Dark Strongs, it's a little bit interesting because of a little bit higher carbonation. Generally in Belgians, you're going to get a more expressive and lively aroma coming off of that because you have all the CO2 releasing the good esters. But a Belgian Dark Strong should also have some good age to it, which means some of the aromas are going to be faded off. It's not going to be the biggest most aromatic beer out there because it does have some age to it or should have some age to it yes it should um, uh, the flavor on this is going to be very similar to what you get off of the aroma uh, you might have some spicy phenols but the dominant flavor is going to be those big dark fruit notes uh, um, not quite getting into that toffee world but a little bit of cooked sugar um, and it, yeah it's not going to be anything cloyingly sweet so you're not getting the direct caramels or toffees but you're getting all those sweet dehydrated fruit notes that you'll get um, from phenomenal yeast productions and certain specialty malts like Special B, um, Special X if you want to even drop the sweetness more um, and then just good esterification um, notes of like strawberry and uh, overripe fruit from the yeast that you're getting yeah uh -uh. And I will say about that, if you're getting any of those caramel flavors coming from it, that is going to be a process, not caramel malts. Definitely not caramel malts. This is a highly inappropriate beer for caramel malt flavor. Yeah. Uh, it's also a beer that makes you highly inappropriate after drinking. <laughs> you know, most of the time for me, but luckily my wife enjoys that. Speaking of mouthfeel, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's yeah. a, this is a high carbonated, uh, smooth, rich beer. Uh, we already mentioned the final gravity can go all the way down to 1.010, but this should have some slickness, some creaminess to uh, the uh, mouthfeel. It should be a, a, a full beer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if there's not residual sweetness, it should have the perception of residual sweetness. Um, part of that can come from other compounds that the yeast produce. Um, but for the most part, it actually can come from some residual sugars. You're going to be starting with a big malt bill at the beginning. Um, you can be drying it out with some level of uh, candy sugar, um, but that candy sugar shouldn't account for a huge percentage of the overall um, alcohol bill. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that's actually a really good point in this. Uh, most of these beers can go very dry and that's the thing going into this 1.010 is the lower end for it and it is a belgian yeast you generally are going to have candy sugar in it these beers do actually tend to go out pretty dry as far as gravity is concerned but you should also have a big richness that helps counteract that so even if it is very dry it shouldn't be perceived as being extremely dry, but neither should it be perceived as being cloyingly sweet. 
Mr. Donald Trump, Carmel is my homie. Shout out to him. Definitely. Uh, also, hello from uh, Aust- Australia or Al Amran. One of those two things. Al Amran. Ren? Um, going into... Uh, Al Amran. I mean, I would say Al-Ren. like, like Ren, like the... Oh, no. I was going German like Ren. Well, at first I didn't Ren. know if it was like uh, AU as in Australia. Ah. So I was like either Australia or Al Amran. Rain? Rain. Uh, anyways. Yeah. Uh, history. It, it, most versions of... I can't even read the history. <laughs> yeah. uh, character, com- individual, breweries. Nothing really good on history that I can uh, ap- actually distinguish. Um, comments. Authentic Trappist versions uh, tend to be drier. Uh, and I, I'll honestly go ahead and say that's probably how I prefer my Belgian quads, um, the booze to kind of be a little bit more prominent and sharp because the beer is uh, more on that dry side. Um, uh, so I think the Trappic versions tend to be drier uh, than the Abbey versions, uh, which can be rather sweet and full bodied. And so that's when we're getting to that 1.024 range. Um, uh, both tend to be bottle conditioned. Um, and so that body condition, bottle conditioning is going to be uh, adding to that mouthfeel, that creaminess. And sometimes known as Trappic quadruple, most are simply known by their strength or color designation yeah that's pretty common for belgian beers i mean you'll have belgian strongs belgian golden strong belgian dark strong um sometimes i mean it's not technically kind of out there but i do delineate the strong ales from the trappist as trappist having for me a little bit more specific yeast characteristic uh than the Bel- belgian strong series you know talking about the Be- or, uh, chimay uh, blue label could technically be considered a belgian strong dark or a dark strong uh where i more of consider that a quad quad to me meaning a little bit more into the trappist realm having that very very specific chimay flavor to it versus what most people are making into it i uh, i don't know I'm, i don't know exactly what i'm trying to describe i for me there's a little bit of a difference between the trappist and then the belgian strongs and i think it mostly just has to do with the yeast uh and it being specific trappist yeast which would make sense yeah that being said a lot or to go along with this huh or made in a church yeah uh maybe because it's holy <laughs> mm. They need to fix those tanks. It leaks too much. That's right. Uh, we're going to drink a Belgian Dark Strong from uh, Brett Ridley. This sucker was uh, made in the third month of this fine year. 9%. Finished out at 1.012 with some Pilsner, Torrified Wheat, Care Munich, Special B. Uh, D180 candy uh, syrup with some Hallertau and Styrian Goldings. Uh, you know, I like that. I like that profile. That's pretty classic. That sounded good. That sounded good. So the Hallertau I usually steer away from because it is uh, a little bit on the lemony grassy side. But in a well-aged beer, a lot of times it's going to fall off anyway. So having a bigger hop load if you want some of that perceived, you know, months down the road when you're finally launching this beer into drinkability. Uh, you know, if you're using three to four ounces of it, it might not be the worst idea. Yeah. Um, and that's also something that I would say for beer styles like this when you're doing things, uh, well, when you're thinking about it, projecting into the future. Uh, a lot of people, oh, it's Belgian. It's got to have the fine, noble continental hops for this specific flavor. You're using it in bittering, and then you're waiting six months to put it out. That specific flavor that you're talking about is long gone by that point. Yeah. Uh, and you might has, as well have used something a lot more simple that you can use a lot less of that's going to respond better in the beer later as it ages out. Warrior! My favorite's Magnum. But Warrior is also on yeah. that. I mean, Magnum's a Halitao derivative, so. I, I like Warrior for most of the American English styles. I like Magnum for most of the German Belgian styles on there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's personal preference. I don't honestly know if it makes a difference. Yeah. Just understanding the regions a little bit. Uh, yeah. Alan's of Calgon. Hello, gentlemen from the UK. Cheers from America. Uh, 77 Transam guy. Cheers from PA. Guessing that's Pennsylvania. 
or this is just my father that I don't know about. Mm. Cheers from Pa. Uh, <laughs> I'm going with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I've got another dad. Paul Style of the Morning, finally caught a live stream while brewing. I'm glad you're here. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, all right, so if there's a couple more things to just go over real quick, we're going to go through over the vital statistics of a quad. Uh, IBUs can be anywhere from 25, 20 to 35. That's brewed IBUs, which means by the time you actually drink it, way gone. Um, SRM, we already said, 12 to 22. OG, anywhere from 1075 to 1 1.110, which is huge. Meaning Absolutely when you dry that off. Huge. Yeah, the, huge. Uh, speaking of Mr. Donald Trump, um, the FG can all go all the way down to a 1.010, and quick math on here says that if you hit that top end of the OG, you should not hit that bottom end of the FG, because the highest ABV this can go to is 12% by style. Um, that said, I mean, we Arts made a 13%, 13. style doesn't really matter, uh, but that is an indicator that you should be scaling up the FG a little bit with the OG. Um, so. If you have that 12% finishing at 1.010, might not be appropriate. And that also kind of has to go along with uh, the mouthfeel and the flavor on this. Alcohol is less viscous than water in there. So if you have more alcohol in it, it's going to feel a little bit thinner. But alcohol is sweeter than water, so it bumps that sweetness level. So you, it dries it out while making it feel sweeter. So you need to leave a little more residual sugars in there to get the appropriate mouthfeel and flavor and just doing some quick mental math here uh, i think that the 1.110 fg that you'd be looking for on the very bottom end would be like 1.014 1.016 so still not super super thick and sweet but definitely sweeter than you know your eight percent finishing at 1.010 yes definitely Right. Well, I think that covers our Belgian quad segment. Uh, our next thing is going to be uh, five tips for your high ABV beers, getting better efficiency on those high ABV, 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 beer, ABV beers. Ab 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 but first, let's talk about this. This is... Uh, I do get a little rose character on the nose. Yeah, I, I, that's from Special B, though. Well, and the D180, maybe. Oh, yeah, it could be the D180. D180 on the is palette. Belgian candy sugar, uh, and it's just the darkest of them. Overall, the dryness, relative dryness of this beer, I'm going to guess this one finished at 1.014 or 2 or something like that. 1.012. Perfect. The relative dryness, of the thing, I think, is pushing forward some of those roast notes as well. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I could do with a little bit more fruity notes in this. It's really nice, but I could do with a little bit more fruity notes. Yeah. Maybe it's on the clean side. From uh, an extended boil. On that. I feel like I can actually still taste the halotau. Like it tastes a little lagery. What yeast was used? Uh, 350. WLP 350. 530. 530. Not that I know the difference, but yeah. I don't think in White Labs anymore. Yeah. The, I mean, the yeast character is really reserved on that. And that is something that I don't mind. The yeast character can be all over on the place on this. You can have a pretty strong spicy yeast character. For me, a little bit more leaning into the Trappist style yeast. I personally love to throw our den on this. It gives it that little bit more fruity bubblegum character, um, like St. Bernardus Ab 12, uh, which is one of my favorite strong darks out there. Yeah. This is really reserved. It feels like a cooler fermentation going on in there. It's a and clean beer, though. Very clean. Yeah. Um, Almost too clean. But it's really yeah. good. It's it's tasty by itself. Uh, just when I'm thinking Belgian dark strong, I want that that extra fruitiness. That's um, you know raisin and prune kind of note. Uh, uh, yeah. Au Amrain is in Germany. Yeah. yeah. Welcome. That's awesome. And we got somebody from Australia as well, or the land of Oz. One of the two. Oh, my mind froze. Like I I don't know. I mean, immediately I thought like you know the Rhine River Valley. Um, when I was reading that, and my mind went to Germany, and then it also went to really, really, really good Rieslings. Because when you have a real German Riesling, it is so damn tasty, and it makes me question why American winemakers ever made that sweet crap. I know zero geography. Mm. I only know that just because my sister and brother-in-law went over there to drink wine because they are wine snobs. Uh, and I don't mean <laughs> that like insultingly. They are they are legitimate like wine wine snobs. But fudge them. Yeah. 
Dang uh, it. They don't send me enough free wine, so. The uh, Chateau St. Michel uh, winemaker, I believe, is straight out of Germany. He tries to make it in that German style. So that one's a little bit drier. It's, a, it's still kind of sweet. It's still kind of sweet. In, in all honesty, the one that I can find uh, around that's pretty easily to get a hold of, at least in our area, is Clean Slate. Uh, and even it's not quite... It's one of those things, American Riesling is so candy sweet. When you get a German Riesling, there's that big green apple. And yeah, there's residual Mm. sweetness left over, but it's still like light and crispy and fine. Uh, It's just, it's so delicious. So delicious. Um, anyway, that's 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 my rant for right Brett now. Ridley. This is delicious. I would drink a lot of this. It has that lager kind of feel, which to me says chug it. So that's a bad idea. I'm guessing mm-hmm. that comes from a combination of the Pilsner malts and the Hallertau yeast. I'm not familiar with that WLP 530, so I can't really speak to that. I meant Hallertau hops, not the yeast. Um, but that's very very good. Just for my personal preference, I like a little bit more of that fruitiness. You can tell it's very very well brewed. Process is is there for sure. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, just. Uh, Maybe a higher fermentation temperature next time. I really can't complain. It's a, it's a phenomenal beer. I would drink a lot of that. It's a great beer. If someone handed this to me and said, uh, asked me to guess the beer, I probably wouldn't be guessing Belgian uh, Dark Strong. I probably would be guessing something in a, a German range, actually. Yeah. Um, Imperial Schwage beer. Yeah. I mean, almost like an Imperial Dunkelweiss, but it didn't catch the roast. It doesn't uh, have banana either. Yeah, it has that just a tiny little touch of clove, but it's it, yeah, it's so light it's almost unintentional. Yeah, I love it. It's great beer though. Great beer. I'm gonna call it an imperial dark pilsner. Yeah. Um, Patrick Glazer, riesling that was less sweet. I still don't enjoy white wine, but I dislike that less. That's the yeah. right attitude. It, uh, yeah, you know it's. It's one of those things like, you you know, if you've been drinking American Pilsner Mm. all your life, and I say that really insultingly because Miller is not an American Pilsner in no way, shape, or form, uh, and then all of a sudden you have a German Pilsner, they are so damn different. It's so much more. I don't know. I'm off of that. I'm off of that. It wasn't even wind out there. I I know. Maybe the building's shaking a little bit. Ours? Yeah. There's a little rattle. Ooh. And that might just be one of the doors. Uh, Patrick Glazer, yeah. Freem is pretty good, of course. Freem's yeah, free, I mean, second best in the Northwest. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know. Olson at Chris, perfect day for a 10% IPA. Let's get into topic number one, because I'm sure you guys are waiting for it. Uh, I know we're going to have some more questions to answer along the way, but that's why not a, just jump into, yeah, that's just jump a good into some lead of these? In. That's a good lead in. 10% IPA, five tips to help you better mash. For high ABV beers. Yeah, so uh, I, uh, one of the biggest things, we're specifically focusing I'm this. Sorry, that not even mash. Five tips for high ABV beers. Yeah. 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 For better efficiency overall. Efficient overall. You know, part of it's going to, a lot of it's going to be due, to do with mash, but we've got some other stuff in there too. Um, but uh, this is specifically focused on high ABV beers because of some of the limitations that you can get when you are uh, mashing and brewing high ABV beers. Number one, and probably your biggest over thing to overcome is going to be if you're in any sort of vertical system, uh, the more grain you have in there, the more layers of grain you have to go through, which means that channeling is going to be an issue. And so we've got a couple ways to kind of get over that. Um, and then also uh, uh, liquid absorption. So there's you have less water to rinse off from your mash um, if you're doing a high ABV beer. ABV beer. So those are kind of some of the challenges that we're going to try to work around with these tips. Yeah. And specifically, too, in the home brewing world, it's a lot more difficult to do some of these beers because of limitations of equipments. You know, a lot of time in the bigger, more professional world, our mash tons are oversized, and it's a lot easier to be able to do, oh, I'll just add more water to it type of tricks. Uh, where at a home brew, you have a 10 gallon igloo cooler, and you just can't do that. There's some things in here that will help you do that. So. so our number one tip is going to be ramp mashing, and this is actually a lot easier to do than a lot of people would think. Uh, the reason the, the reason we're thinking of ramp mashing is twofold. Um, number one is it can give you a wider range of enzymes, and so doing a, a stepped mash um, it can be a lot easier if you're doing ramp mashing and um, hitting multiple... Uh, sacrification points for alpha and beta amylase uh, will also be a lot smoother and so when we do ramp mashing that's pretty much all we do we do it overnight so specifically 
How is ramp different than step? Good question. So a ramp is a slow, gradual uh, pull from your low temperature mash in to your high temperature mash out. So basically, instead of like in step mashing where you temperature raise temperature, you're just going to smooth the line up the whole way. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do this overnight. Um, and on the homebrew scale, there's a couple ways to do this. Uh, one of them would be if you have one of the coffee can style systems like the Anvil Foundry, uh, the Mash and Boil, the Brewzilla, the Robo Brew, the Brew Father, um, or Grain Father, all those. You can just, while recirculating, you can set, um, and if you have Anvil, set it to a low wattage to reduce the risk of scorching or burning on the bottom. Um, mm. But then while recirculating, just have some sort of heat source on there so that it's constantly going up. Uh, and when we do this, I'll also say that if you want to, if you eliminate proteins, which can be good for a couple different reasons, then you want to start in at a lower temperature right around 125. You're going to hit everything. You're going to, um, but you also want to spend time in those areas. So when you're doing ramp bashing, keep it in mind that you have to give enzyme times to work and you need to spend a half an hour to 45 minutes within a certain time range so it's not like going from 120 up to 170 and a half an hour is going to work don't do that no uh, try to spend that good like in that nice eight to ten minute range try to spend about a half an hour 45 minutes in each stepping range as it's slowly moving up um, getting into the sacrification part of it, one of the reasons that I really like doing a ramp mashing for high ABV, ABV beers is because with a lower grist to liquid ratio, um, things like uh, uh, beta glucans uh, can cause channeling a lot easier, especially if you're trying to um, uh, really, really quickly mash or pull out water and then put it back in. So uh, beta glucans are kind of gummy things that don't let water go through them and said they go across them and so if you imagine a layer of beta glucans right here and a lot of good sugars underneath then the rinsing water the sparging water isn't going to get those if it can't go through them so it's going to slide off and you're going to miss a lot of good sugars so you want to maximize that efficiency um, and one of the ways to do that is with ramp mashing because uh, it's going to slowly be um, t having enzymatic activity at the same time that it is getting um, more liquefied so the warmer things get think of it like honey when you microwave it the warmer your sugars and your mash get the more liquid they get and so uh, if you were to just have the low end of the temperature range your sugars would be too honey like and not go no through very easily too viscous too viscous and uh, on the higher end of the temperature range you're not getting all the good enzyme conversion so it's runny, but your enzymes aren't working. So if you do a ramp mash, you kind of eke your way through all those and make sure that you're converting sugars at the same time that you are um, uh, increasing liquidity. Viscosity. Visco decreasing viscosity. Decreasing viscosity. And actually... Flowability. That, yeah, that's uh, a really good thing. That's one thing that people don't think about in Spargout. Ramping up gets you uh, your mash up to an actual sparg out temperature that 170 and one of the deals about getting it up to 170 is the viscosity and for better lauderability a lot of science words flowing around in here if your liquids flow better you will be able to rinse off your grains better basically and being able to reduce the viscosity of the whole thing by making all of your enzymes work through up all those steps, as well as actually getting the mash up to the proper mash out temperatures will really make a more, uh, or yeah, less viscous, and I have to reverse all of those, uh, a less viscous fluid, which basically means it's gonna be more runny and it can flow out better. So then when you sparg, you actually can flow it out better. You can sparg out better and you're pulling off more sugars. Yes. I have, I have to tell you, all I can think about that, and now I can't even think of the uh, actor's name, but he played Faramir in Lord of the Rings. Uh, the movie in my mind right now is Van Helsing. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and literally, they're in the top. He's with Kate Beckinsale. Oh, man, she is so fine in that movie. Matt, mm, research. Uh, then there, there's a serum to cure vampirism. And he's like, I'm not sticking my hand in that viscous fluid. And then they break it open and it's acid. And he's like, see, viscous fluid. Uh, in a loop on my head, viscous. 
Can I say it once more? Viscous. Van Helsing was a good movie. Ah, that was a, it was a great fun romp. I mean, it oh, really David, was. David Wenham? Wenham? Yeah, Wenham. maybe. Uh, I, he was Faramir. I mean, <laughs> really an actor. He was fantastic, especially like to go from Lord of the Rings and seeing him as Faramir, where you're like, this is so, he's so much better than Boromir. Uh, and then you see him just be that in Van Helsing. That was awesome. Great actor range on that. I appreciate you for that. Uh, that was fantastic. Viscosity. 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 One thing I want to hit on before we go too much further, and I don't think I really hit on it very well, talking about the protein rest. When I'm talking about beta-glucans creating channeling too, which kind of, you know, that's what acts against the flow ability. Um, if you hit that protein rest, that'll also reduce beta-glucans. Uh, and a beta-glucanase works at a very wide temperature range all the way down from like 109 to 129, I think. Um, Alt Altitude Brewing Arizona, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, we have an Altitude Trampoline Park here in Spokane. So if you're thinking of like a crossover business idea. Um, you know, we, we, we would be willing to, uh, to jump that in. happen. Yeah. Jump in on that <laughs> because we think we could bounce this idea very high up. And then even yeah. if we stumble and fall, it's okay. We will be caught and bounced back on our feet. That's true. All right, unless you have a bunch of mean kids around you that just keep bouncing you on the ground and then you're rolling around going, oh, man, this sucks. Unless you're doing the break the egg game where you, like, hold up and, you know, see, see how long you can last. If you stand in a little bit, like, it doesn't make sense. It may be because the oxygen's getting thin. It, you, you know, there's because, of height. because, you know, we're, it's just because of the, word, because altitude. Of the altitude. I guess you're you not, always think of high altitude. Altitude just means all altitudes. It, it means can be all sea level. altitudes. Yeah. The break the egg game's fun, fun though. And you get a trampoline. A, no, no, that's atmosphere. Dang it. Dang it. <laughs> Someone uh, buy me a trampoline. Um, uh, we had some good questions going through that first part of it. So we, I go uh, we actually, go well, ramp mashing. I also do want to hit on ramp mashing, too. If you're doing ramp mashing, uh, recirculate the whole time while you're doing it. Yes. That way you do not get hot spots or burn anything. If you can't put it on a direct here to ramp it up, you can do something like we do. We actually run our beer through an immersion coil into a separate electric kettle that is slowly heating up. Um, so you can then do an indirect heating method on there, which also helps to make sure nothing's scorching. Basically, we pump our beer out of our main mash tun uh, through a wort chiller that's sitting in hot water, and that hot water is increasing temperature, and then it goes through that coil and back into the top of our mash tun. So that's how the recirculation mechanism works for us. I've yeah. also seen people do the opposite where their mash is recirculating, but they've also got a wort chiller in a hot water kettle, and the wort chiller is in the mash as well and they've got just water going through that one loop and beer going through this other loop and so it's slowly like sending boiling water right through it to, it to bring it up and kind of mixing in that one's less efficient because it doesn't involve the wort actually heating up and going back in but yeah and uh, it also it, works it pre helps prevent scorching it helps prevent hot spots it helps the enzymes work so they're fully getting mixed <clears> through <throat> everything but it's also really going to help create cleaner clear beer too because your beer will basically be filtering out a lot of chunks and smaller particulates through the mash bed the whole time while it's recirculating adam shumbly so what steps slash temps would you suggest for my eight percent abv christmas sale that depend, depends very very much on the protein load of your grist so if you've got high protein base malt or a high adjunct bill my answer is probably gonna be a little different in that mm. instance we have a, a high high ish protein load i would say 122 ramp mash up to 152 and then decoction because christmas sale loves that little decoction flavor into 170 if you're, if you're in a perfect world um on average, if you just start at 142 and go up to 170, for most beers, it's a really good, for single infusion, you've got high modified, low protein malts, um, very few adjuncts that, uh, that need extra modification. 142 on the low end, just to make sure you're kind of scooping up all that beta amylase and then take a couple hours to get up to 170. That's usually pretty good. Uh, great question, right? But, uh question we're going to address because it'll be really quick right below that uh austin du Bois, uh, what do y'all think about co-pitching voss quike with diamond longer don't because quike's going to munch everything so damn fast that diamond longer is not going to have a chance to react plus you're also taking two extremes of yeast 
<laughs> Diamond Lager, uh, well, it ferments clean and well if you push it out of its temperature range, and its temperature range is high 50s. It's not breaking into 60s. Uh, you do get to start get fruity off flavors on that. Vosquite can ferment down into the low 60s, but then you pretty much lose every, all of its good quikiness. It loves to be up at 90. So it's either lose the quike or produce some weird off flavors uh, from Diamond Lager. And Quike's still probably going to take it before Diamond Logger has a chance to do anything. Yeah, you, that's, those are two that you probably should keep separate just because one's going to be really dominant at one temperature range and really just shouldn't be involved at the other temperature range. Yeah, uh, it, co-pitching anything with Quike, you just need to make sure that it's going to ferment after Quike takes all the sugars. So uh, it's pretty much bacteria or bread. Or French saison. Yeah, that might just kill most of the Quike, though. That's true. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jeff Talent, cranberry beer, sorry. pale winter lager, or Belgian single. Don't know what the context is, but because of Thanksgiving, I'm going to say cranberry beer. Mm. Yeah. Matt I, I like, I like says that, that we've that got idea. 30 seconds to get off topic. What? Thanks, thanks for reining us in. <laughs> what, what, what? I don't even hear that. We were off topic for a while. I think that's when he sent it. This is a while ago. We're, kinda, oh. we're catching up on... Uh, um, Catching up on some comments. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we are there. <laughs> um, beer and trampolines. Good Aussie act. There was one uh, right below that in there. Was it from oh, Also? Uh, from what? Also? It's probably Al So. Al So. Al So. Uh, you should send us some of that Riesling because I would be 100% willing to taste test it for you and tell you that it's probably awesome. Uh, Nocturnal Brewer, we're, don't jump ahead of us. Don't jump ahead of us. Um, it's getting there. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, let's tackle our, ne- tackle our next topic before we get a few more questions. Our next part on that, which is holes. Um, so speaking of flowability, if you're going to do a, if you're not going to do a um, beta glucanase or a gluco, uh, beta glucan rest, beta, beta glucanase Protein rest. Protein rest. If you're not going to do a protein rest to reduce beta glucans, I don't know why it took so, my, so long for my brain to get there. <laughs> because you're getting back on topic. <laughs> exactly. That's the wrong idea. Putting the train back if you're not on gonna, the tracks. Yeah, if you're not going to do a protein rest, you're still going to have those beta glucans, which, again, you can think of those as like little mini shells made out of gum that wa- uh, water doesn't like to flow through. Um, then rice holes are a really good way to increase your efficiency. And we actually recommend rice holes for any vertical system. So if you've got an anvil foundry, a uh, green father, a mash and boil, a brusilla, all those coffee can style all in one systems, if they are more tall than they are wide, then um, rice holes at that point are almost a must. And what those are going to do is, well, you've got that little shelf, um, shelf full of gum that water doesn't like to thro- thro- flow through. Uh, the rice holes will get in the middle of those and s- make small gaps that water can flow through so you can get all the sugars and i'm gonna actually go ahead and say on there we recommend rice holes for almost every beer it's gonna make your life better for everything whether you really think about think you need it or not rice holes are just gonna make your life easier we do throw them in pretty much every beer that we use just to increase lauderability and increase our fit efficiency because we have increased lauderability in there. They're hella cheap, so it's one of those why nots. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, if you have the opportunity, do it. Use rice holes and everything. But primarily why you are using exactly what Peter is talking about. You are just increasing the fluffiness of your mash in there. Putting all Instead of laying flat, you're putting all these nice little gaps on things. So... All the work can flow through it. You're getting maximum contact for all of your enzymes. That includes all the ones that breaks down the beta-glucans and makes it gummy. That includes things that break down starches. So you're just getting higher efficiency and lauderability all in one. If you are out there and our hand gesture visuals uh, helped you out, then uh, raise your hand and then also you, you have to like the video. That's a rule? That is... And- 100% rule. If you enjoy the magic hands, you have to like our videos. That's right. Um, yeah. Uh, there was something on, oh, the cranberry beer. When you were saying uh, uh, do the cranberry beer, he was asking cranberry either in the winter lager or the uh, Belgian single, I believe. Uh, pale winter lager or Belgian single. 
uh, with a cranberry beer that actually to me jumps out as being a Belgian straight off that's going to be super complimentary flavors but I really like the idea of making an almost a little bit of a bitter uh, pale winter lager mm. but the bitterness comes from the tannicness of the cranberry it's one of those it's just so refreshing to have ice cold in the snow you're sledding your call. face is like stinging because it's so cold you crack open one of those boys it's still super cold and you're like man i should be drinking something warm but this is so refreshing like, that, that does sound really good i yeah, yeah I, I almost uh i would almost almost want a mintiness but i don't, don't want to like thomas's mintiness mm. on that one like almost mm. like you know almost that winter greenness but i do think with the cranberry i if you did Belgian, if you did the Belgian, obviously our dens Belgian blonde style with cranberry, yeah. and I can oh. almost see some aperitif type type bitterness. Yeah, you know some. Uh, but instead of even our den on there, even uh, mixing all of that and go with sundew. Uh, sundew is from Wilfred Lopsflapowitz. Lopsvilowitz. What's the hand gesture for Ask Corpse? Twenty bucks. Thank you for the twenty bucks. I appreciate the super chat. Do you have what's your Ascorps question? Your hand gesture for Ascorps is that. Perfect. <laughs> that one. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so I, instead of doing mintiness, a touch of rosemary, cranberry rosemary mm. or cranberry sage. I like the sage idea too. And just yeah. a little scotch. The herbaceousness should just. Just a little scotch, just a little, here's the hand gesture for it. Just a little tickle on the bottom, just a little tickle on the bottom uh, <laughs> that you don't even almost know it's there. That, oh man, that's so good. Okay, sorry, off topic. We're back on topic. What are you talking about? Uh, uh, well, we are on holes. We pretty much hit that. Uh, we might make a video coming soon, but the basic idea of rice holes is to increase the fluffiness of your uh, mash makes a better lauderability uh, it makes a better better flow ability in there so it's going to increase your efficiency on every beer use them um les paul slayer let's get a question real quick les paul sweat lee paul les paul uh doing a baltic porter brew a bag with some really gummy two row on a stovetop advice for mass schedule uh yes actually um that's a really good idea to do a protein rest um Protein rest, you can start anywhere in the 120 to 130 range. Um, when I do a full-on decoction step mash, I'll go 109, 122, 136, 148, and then mash out. But that said, if you're doing a brew in a bag, that's going to be very, very difficult to do without specialized equipment. So I'll probably flop right in the middle at like 125, 126 for your initial mash in. Um, Take your bag out, heat your water up, uh, put your bag back in, and try to hit right in that 148 range for your second. Um, uh, 148 to 150, um, get that full sacrification. Hopefully, most of the beta glucans at that 125, and, the, and 122 to 125 is kind of that sweet spot for beta gluconase. Um, and then uh, I would still recommend a mash out. So, again, take your bag out, put it in a, in a side bucket, heat your water up, put it back in, uh, get everything warmed up to a mash out at 170. Again, that flow ability is going to maximize your efficiency, uh, and that's kind of the last point where you're good to go. Put that back into your side bucket. Do a hot water sparge if you have the ability, and then continue your brew day like normal. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't intentional, I, but, you know, we were talking about Belgian Strong Dark, so we had to drink the last one. Our next beer is also from Brett Ridley. It's a tart ale with blueberry, raspberry, blackberry, strawberries, and lactose. With pale malt, white wheat, flaked oats, Medusa, and Philly soured. It's a beautiful color. This is one of the cleanest beers I've tasted made with the Philly sour yeast. You can get, I'm actually getting a pretty decent graininess coming off of it. And I'm imagining it's the pale malt, but that's interesting that there's that amount of grainy character still coming off of pale malt. Uh, yeah, and this one is mm. there is a little bit of funkiness, a little bit of cloviness to it, but it's not it's not uh, like uh, I've had a lot of Philly sour yeast to get a little bit overness um, over on yeah. that. I think maybe because of a relatively low protein malt bill uh, would be my guess. I mean, it's decent. I, 
probably also a little bit of that lactose is sweetening that out. Yeah. Um, there, I will say there's probably also some of the graininess may not be graininess, but tannicness coming from uh, all of the fruit being in there. Mm -hmm. But that's really nice. That's a pleasant tart beer. Um, that's one of the better Philly sour beers I've had. Great job, Brett. Definitely. All right. One more question before we get into that. Earthbound again. Wood fermenting an Irish ale with Safel SO4 at 70 degrees be too fruity? Um, well, probably not. Probably not. Personally, for my own flavor standpoint, if you ferment it too warm, uh, if you're going over that 70 at all, my taste buds will probably come up. The SO4 is going to come off a little bit too bready for an Irish ale. Um, yeah, the SO470 is like that upper echelon. It can be, it can do a lot of great things at lower temperatures, but above 70, it starts to have all those classic English fruitiness. What, or, yeah, and I just I think of fruitiness like overripe fruit, like fruit that's just been sitting around for a little bit too much. Like some people really enjoy that. They enjoy it. It's got extra perceived sweetness and all that in it. But uh, when you pick up a peach and its skin almost slides off because it's that mushy. And it can be really good like that, but it has that extra little bruised quality to it. Yeah. That's bruised the fruitiness fruit. that warm English yeasts kind of put out. Yeah. And I just, uh, you know, in all honesty, uh, SO4 gets too bready if it's too warm. I like it right about, I like it 65 to 68. Uh, 70 is probably fine on that. You're going to catch some of those good fruities and it should be all right. Just personally for me, don't go over that. Uh, Les Paul Slayer also asked, ever use double roasted crystal? Oh, yes, yeah. not a huge fan. I, I feel like it's just like a roastier crystal. I think there's better substitutes. Um, there are reasons to use it, though, but we won't go into too much of that. All right. Uh, this is a really, really <clears throat> important one here. Zymes. We're the back into our topic of the day. Enzymes. Uh, Let's not get that efficiency brewer. up. You are, uh, this is where we're, we're answering your question on there and enzymes are going to help everything. Enzymes, uh, add them, add them to all of your beers. You will see so much better results on it. And for the people who think that it's not natural, what do you think that we actually do to make beer? Yeah. We just we, find, we, yeah. We use enzymes. enzymes. Uh, like, how do you, yeah. How do you, if you want to like less natural, how do you think sake is made? They take, you know, enzymes that you can get naturally from a different plant and they put it in there and they convert the rice nice. and they, like, and they it's, ferment it. It's enzymes. And you're using the same enzymes that are coming from the grains. Like, just because it comes from a, I don't know, sorry. Uh, someone, this is my soapbox rant. Someone once, through a brew day, didn't want to use enzymes because they weren't natural and I want to do all natural brewing. Like, you are such a fool. We're adding in the thing that's making beer. I'm sorry. That, did you not want to make beer? Uh, anyway, rant over. So there are a couple of different enzymes that we commonly use. Uh, one is ViscoBuster and one is OptiMash. We've talked a lot about beta-glucans, and you guys obviously loved our hand signals when it comes to, like, getting rid of that gum shelf. Yeah. Um, ViscoBuster takes care of that. It's a beta-glucanase with a couple of other, other enzymes that is designed to thin out the mash from proteins. And these are proteins that won't end up in your final beer pretty much regardless. Um, uh, but all the Visco Buster does is break up those proteins and makes it so that they don't inhibit your ability to get the maximum efficiency out of your beer. Um, the other one is going to be OptiMash. Uh, OptiMash is a blend of amylase enzymes and uh, adjacent to amylase enzymes uh, to make sure that you're cleaving long starches that will uh, either over add body uh, or not up and end up your, in your beer in the first place. Um, and so it really doesn't affect the flavor all too much, although there are some smaller chain starches that may get converted that wouldn't otherwise. So uh, it will thin your beer to some extent. You know, and in all honesty, to go along with that, everything that we do gets enzymes here just because I love the efficiency out of it. And I love knowing that I no longer have to worry about uh, unfermented uh, sugars or sugars long chain sugars or anything like that as far as a worry in my beers that's a uh how am i trying to say this it's a variable that's been taken out i can now fully control my beers body my beers creaminess based on grains 
and I can take the sugar aspect out of it, basically. Yeah. Uh, it goes into our hazy IPAs. It goes into our juicy IPAs. I still put OptiMash and Visco Buster in there. Even though those are things that you do want in your beer, those are things that I put in there because I believe it makes a cleaner, better tasting beer. And then I just add things like flake grains or to create creaminess. Uh, and the question about glucoamylase, glucoamylase can be used as a mash enzyme, so it will help conversion. It's most commonly only appropriate if you are going to have relatively low conversion otherwise, meaning um, you have a grist that doesn't have enough diastatic power to convert all your grains. Uh, but glucoamylase actually isn't the best mash enzyme. Um, a blend enzyme like a, what we use, OptiMash, and there's a couple other blend enzymes like that that are meant for um, optimizing your mash. Um, are more appropriate. Uh, glucoamylase we most commonly use as a fermentation enzyme because it can also, during fermentation out of that low temperature, continue to break down starches and give you a drier beer, uh, also increasing your alcohol percentage. But that alcohol percentage doesn't necessarily equate to efficiency. So uh, yes and no when it comes to making high ABV beers. We, yeah. u- we use it for a lot of high ABV beers, but that's to get what would normally be like a 1035 FG down to like a 1020 FG and that 1020 FG is, is going to be more alcoholic, but that doesn't necessarily mean a more efficient beer. Yeah, and it, it helps in uh, higher ABV beers as well because then you can do other techniques like boiling for longer, especially in something like Belgian Strong Dark or English Barley Wine to get those really good Maillard caramelization toffee flavors coming in through it. But the enzymes are gonna help the beer from becoming too cloyingly sweet because you're fermenting out most of the good sugars on or you're fermenting out most of the sugars that make it too caramely sweet because of the enzymes while keeping a better Maillarded sugar in there. They're great. They're absolutely great. Use them. And that's something to help out in big ABV beers that not just in the match, use them like the glucoamylase, using it in the fermentation as well to help your yeast stay in that nice simple sugar fermentation and that's something to help your yeast out in these big avb beers is to stay fermenting simple yeast so they don't get overwhelmed especially late in their life when they're getting tired and it's alcoholic it's becoming a toxic environment in there for them so uh pamela hakala uh, how long can sanitized equipment be sit out before having to be re-sanitized? Uh, depends on the sanitizer. So if it's star sand, there should be some foam left in there that's still battling for you. It's still doing some good stuff. Um, if it's cleaned and uh, there's not foam left, it's still defending you. Not long. I mean, don't let don't let it sit more than a couple minutes. Uh, my basic advice for that is you should sanitize everything right before you use it. And if you haven't done it right before you use it and it's not an entirely closed CO2 purge system, then you should sanitize it before you use it. And if it is a closed CO2 purge system, you should sanitize it before you use it. Yeah, 100%. Don't risk any of your stuff for something as silly as sanitation. Share that with fire. No, sorry, go. Uh, Dim Castles, I use Solar Science Glucobuster, works like a charm. Yeah, that's a great uh, option uh, as well. Does adding rice holes increase your grain bill, meaning you need more water? Uh, no, they are re- relatively uh, incapable of absorbing liquid. Uh, that being said, if you are using a narrow vertical system, uh, something like the coffee can systems that we're talking about, the anvil, the brew man, or uh, grain father, uh, mash and boil, all that stuff, it does increase the volume that's in there. So you might need to add some more water just, just to get to, to that m- spot. Make sure that it's covering. Uh, do rice holes add any discernible flavor? No, if you use them right. Um, there is a potential, since it is the whole of a grain, there is a potential if you over sparg with way too hot of water to extract tannins, um, that is less of a worry than you think it is and that books make it out to be. There also is a worry that if you add way too much uh, <laughs> rice holes in there, 
it could potentially add a flavor, but it, everything drops out. You know, it's not not something that you should worry about. Adam Chumley has a great uh, great comment in response to that. I've rinsed uh, I've rinsed rice holes before mashing due to reading something online. Two things never happened again. Number one, me reading message boards, and number two, me rinsing rice holes. Yeah. Uh, That's a good answer to that question. It really is. Any flavor that is in rice holes won't affect the flavor of your beer. Not at all. If you think it does, come down, try our beers, and tell me which ones have rice holes and which ones don't. I mean, they all do, but tell me you notice them. All right, one more before we go on to the next uh, tip. Ogre librations, what about squeezing the grains to get the most sugars out of the mash? A okay, we've done a couple of videos on that. Um, there are some uh, some myth risks that we've heard about in uh, in the past uh, against squeezing the grain bag, but for the most part, through natural processes and brewing, any negative uh, effects from squeezing the grain bag uh, will uh, drop out. Especially if you use ascorbs, and that's kind of relating back to the video we posted um, this last week. And some of the myths about squeezing out the grain bag might <clears throat> be true. If you're making, you know, like a 30 barrel batch of grains yeah. and you squeezing out all those really gummy glucans would probably gum up your uh, pump at that point, you know, because you would have 30 pounds of it. But as a home brewer, it's something you can worry yeah. about a lot less. I mean, just look at full sale. I mean, they're the, they're the ultimate bag squeezers. Uh, you know, I definitely got my bag squeezed when I was there. Yeah. It was a great experience, too. Full sale is a fun, they've got a fun system. So basically, full sale powderizes all the grains. And then instead of mashing it like normal, it gets all run through this giant reducing filtration system. And there is like not a drop of sugar left. Yeah. It's incredible. When you can, I mean, you know you made it when you can do something that fancy. Yeah. Uh, All right, let's go on to number four before we get into any more questions. Number four is going to be slow recirculation. Uh, and this one um, kind of works with the, with the fluffiness of the rice holes that we talked about. Um, but the reason for slow recirculation is a lot of people when they're doing, let's say they don't have a pump and they're manually recirculating and they have a false bottom, they like to open up their valve at the bottom and then fill up a pitcher and then pour it over the top, you know, lather, rinse, repeat or they've got a pump that they want to recirculate and they just turn that pump on full bore. The thing that happens when you have a liquid system up here and you've got something pumping or siphoning water out the bottom is it squishes. So your entire grain bed squishes. Imagine you have, let's just take beta glucans for example. Imagine in your mash, you've got beta glucans here and beta glucans here. And then your entire grain bed goes like that. All of a sudden your beta glucans go whoosh, and they make it very, very difficult for water to rinse through them efficiently. And so you can get stuck mashes. You can definitely lose efficiency with a faster recirculation. Um, you can cavitate your pump, all sorts of things. It's uh, If you're reading in the <coughs> brewing books about something called mash compaction or compacting the mash, this is what it's talking about. And you can watch it. As you're sparking out, you can watch your grain bed start to sink down. And what you're trying to do while you're recirculating and slow recirculating is keep it in that really big, loose, fluffy mass. So your grains never really ever move in the circulation. It's just the water that's just slowly moving through everything, leaving that fluffy mash in there. So your recirculation can hit everything. And I also do kind of have to comment, uh, the five tips while well, used independently are great. These are all things that should be used in conjunction with each other. This, uh, slow recirculation is wonderful, but pair that up with ramp mashing and your efficiency is going to be amazing. You pair up ramp mashing with enzymes and slow recirculation, you might see 10 gravity points improvement into your efficiency after this that's what we saw at least yeah sorry but a little off topic but that's not really it goes with it it goes yeah. along with it it's almost like we're telling you to do everything we do do uh, it but that's the thing about this you're not trying to squish everything you're not trying to run it through it doesn't need to be ran through really fast 
to do the slow recirculation to benefit everything you want to do it nice and slow and easy that way all the enzymes can run into each other they can hit the sugars they can do their job for it when you're getting all of the per, uh, protein particulates and the powder of the grain to settle out it's settling out inside of there and not just tumbling around uh, slow and steady on that slow and steady it's like b good barbecue it needs to take time yeah especially when you're barbecuing turtles mm. <laughs> all right let's go on to okay. some cool more questions before going into the last one uh we've got nocturnal brewers uh thoughts when using philly sour skip the traditional kettle sour or not uh yes just do it normally it's just basically a super easy brew day um patrick no uh scott Cr crosby is there a risk of drying a beer out too much when using extra enzymes like the optimash like we talked about before, no, um, OptiMash is not going to brute a beer like gl glucoamylase will, especially not in the mash. Um, so you can control that fluffiness or that fullness uh, of the final product with malt selection. I'm going to amend that in saying that knowing yet, if you brew without consideration that you're using enzymes, it can definitely go drier than you intended it to go because you're using extra enzymes but as long as you as a brewer realize hey i'm using something that converts extra sugars let's compensate for that no it shouldn't dry it out too much as most of those guys have learned compensation doesn't get you much <laughs> uh, oh wait no it does, it does this, yeah yeah it does. in this case it, yeah. it, it you can always compensate <laughs> uh uh, All right. Uh, have you used Aromazyme? No, get me that. Um, we have something very similar, but it's mostly for wine, I believe, over there. Nah. But no, we haven't used it. Um, but, I mean, we're trying to do the same thing when we use the Cosmic, uh, cosmic whatever, it's Cosmic Punch. Cosmic Punch? Oh, yeah. yeah kind of. Th thylization. The thylization. Yeah, we have a yeast from Omega called Cosmic Punch, which is their British Ale 5. Uh, which is basically <coughs> London Ale 3 or the British London Ale yeast that everybody loves to use for juices because it's really good. Uh, Omega basically edited it so that yeast could thialize hops or basically ferment hop terpenes and flavors. And it's pretty cool. It actually makes an amazing beer. Uh, highly recommend it. Yeah. Uh, KO Brewing, I have a bag of bottle caps that might be something like five years old. Do unused bottle caps go bad? That's beyond my knowledge base. I would guess no, but I, if, if it's a oxygen-absorbing crown cap, I don't actually know the answer to that question. If it's an oxygen-absorbing crown cap, I would be willing to bet that it lost its oxygen-absorbing power if it has been open and exposed to the atmosphere hmm. for five years. That would be my guess. I'm falling behind. Crispy Boys by B.T. Ridley. This is a Munich Hellas, um, and this beer is not too bad. B.T. Um, Ridley? We're drinking another Ridley beer? All right. Brett Ridley, you are apparently just supplying our beer for today, and I ain't mad about it. Is B.T. the same, <laughs> the same as Brett? I, I don't know. Uh, but, I mean, Tim just grabbed some beers. That's what you I, that's what I did. I did. Um, this beer almost tastes a little bit skunked. I actually don't mind that because – I grew up drinking skunk beer, and it's got, like, that nostalgic flavor for me. Um, like it, it, for, yes, a Munich Hellas, no. for a Munich Hellas, it tastes a little flat. Like, it doesn't have a, that full Munich-y, that malt character that you want. But it's, I mean, it's, good, it's good beer. It's sweet. It almost tastes like there's flaked rice and, like, that creaminess of mm. flaked rice. It's um, a, there's a subtle fruitiness from the yeast. But it's, it's not – I wouldn't call this a crispy boy, but it's a good drinking beer. Yeah. And I personally, I'd like to see it a little brighter, a little more carbonated. I think that'd help out. It is a little bit sweeter and fuller on the grains and not quite as grainy as I would expect from uh, Hellas. Yeah. Uh, super <clears throat> enjoyable. I really like this. I could crush it a lot. It reminds I just me, want it to be brighter. It reminds me of the slightly sulfurier um, cream ale that I made because I used mm. to make cream ales with flaked rice all the time. Um, oh, speaking, oh, speaking of, of which, yeah. Pamela <laughs> Hakala, how do you use flaked rice in recipes? Here's a way. Yeah, I love uh, – so we use flaked rice a lot when we want to make uh, light lagery beers be dry but have that perception of creaminess. 
Uh, also, flaked rice is what I use in all of our juicy IPAs to keep a little more uh, protein haze out of it. Instead of using flaked wheat, flaked barley, or flaked oats for that creaminess, a lot of the time I'll use flaked rice in it because it gives you a creamy body impression. Uh, a little, and it's not necessarily sweet because it dries things out. How do you use flaked rice? Use flaked rice in anything you want to dry out, but still have an impression of creaminess into it. That's where I like it in juicy IPAs. Um, I add some sweetness basically through oats so it can get some slickness in there, some sweetness, but that creaminess is all coming from the flaked rice for me. Uh, we li I like to use it in our Kolsch. Peter likes to use flaked corn because he likes that corn fruitiness in there. I don't like the corn fruitiness, so to keep that creaminess and that impression of sweetness, I like to use flaked rice into it. Um, you should use more flaked rice, honestly, in most beers. Um, uh, salad official, um, M15 Empire yeast at 62 degrees. That's on the low end of its spectrum, and that's where it's going to get a little bit almost smoky. It's clean, but a little bit almost smoky. It's kind of a, a weird, funky brightness. I like it depending on the beer you're using. Uh, Ger yeah. Gerard, Natalie, I don't use pump to recirculate uh, in my cooler. Um, how about stirring multiple times throughout the mash? Only in the first 20 to 30 minutes. And then after that, let it rest, recirculate with a pitcher or whatever you can, um, and then try to get some clarification. Yeah, I, yeah, don't do it after that. You do want your mash bed to come together and not necessarily settle and congeal, but to conglomerate a little bit. And stirring it up will just disturb that. Uh, uh, putting warm. We'll do one more question before going into the last tip. Uh, how does flaked rice versus cooked rice compare? Um so to complete the gelatinization process, the drying part is actually pretty important. And so cooked rice will work similarly, similarly in a mash. You'll get a lot of similar stuff off of it. Uh, but if you want to do the same thing that flaked rice does, um, then you'd have to cook your rice, make it all squishy, spread it out on a sheet pan, and then dry it out in the oven. Um, it does, uh, <clears throat> it's not going to give you the same flavor and qualities, basically. The flaked rice is going to give you a little bit more full bodiedness in there because of the gelatinization that's going on, the pre-gelatinization. It's going to boost the creaminess of the body where the cooked rice is going to give you more of just the straight up sugars uh, in there. So they're both going to give you pretty much the same like straight up sugars going through there. The flaked rice will give you a little bit more perception of creaminess than the cooked will. All right, our last tip for five tips. Our last tip is going to be a high boil off rate, meaning if you are planning on doing a high ABV beer, you need to expect to have to reduce eight or more gallons of liquid down to your five gallons of pre-ferment. Um, uh, part of this comes from the actual um, absorption the malt's going to go through. If you have a high grain load, let's say for a five gallon batch, you've got a 20 pound grain load, that's going to naturally absorb a lot of sugars. And so if you want your efficiency to be good, it's going to take more liquid, more water to run off and rinse off all those sugars uh, from, uh, from your mash. Um, I like to use a refractometer and kind of figure out where I'm running off. And you really get diminishing returns below 1.012 runoff. So don't worry too much about anything there. But if you are still running off at 1.030 or 1.035 in, in your high ABV beer, keep running off and just plan to boil longer. Boiling longer does, well, the obvious, it concentrates your sugars. But it does a lot more beyond that. It's going to create some Maillard reactions. It's going to create some caramelization reactions in there. Which, one, flavor. That's going to create some really good, sweet, bodybuilding flavors in there. That's still going to allow your beer to dry out. But keep a lot of bigness to support against everything <clears throat> else in it. What that also does for you is create reductones and other things that Peter knows how to say and that you should uh, <laughs> also go watch the video for on Ascorbs 
Uh, but it creates other th uh, stabilization compounds through the May Maillard reaction that allow your beer to age gracefully. If you don't do the Maillard, it's going to be really hard to age your beer in excess of six months to a year to two years where you should be aging it to make these high ABV beers taste better. Yeah, and that's something that uh, honestly, even before, I would say not even until like two years ago, I didn't even understand how powerful the Maillard reaction was. Uh, but there's a lot of things that go on other than just flavor building with the Maillard reaction. Um, you're breaking out proteins that are bad for your beer. You're creating compounds that are good for your beer. Uh, you're also creating a lot of good flavors. Uh, and you're concentrating your sugar for really good high ABV beers. And so like Tim was saying, for beers that you want to age, because usually high ABV beers are very well suited to be aged, um, you want to be able to create those shelf stabilizing compounds. Um, Ean Dials is the other, other one. Ean Dials. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's tip number five. Long boil time always good for big, big boozy beers. Uh, to go along with that, uh, I'm gonna throw that in there. The long boil time. There's a couple of tricks that you can do to create these long boils to create a more efficient mash uh, throughout the whole thing to create better, more complete flavors all going in one. And that's actually um, doing a little bit of a trick. All right, so it's not quite a full double mash. We'll get into that in a second. But doing a trick of taking off the first runnings. Don't sparg anything. Just run your liquid out of your mash time. Take those first or imperial runnings, if you will, and start boiling and reducing those add in some new fresh spark water and then remash and go through the whole process again one that remashing process is actually going to extract more sugars off of there it's going to increase your efficiency off of it because you're pulling more off of off of the whole thing uh, party guile is pretty much what you're doing right here uh, so you're pulling it off, but you're also boiling the other part at the same time and you're well reducing, you're reducing the other part at the same time, your imperial runnings. And as you're reducing it, you're creating the really good Maillard reactions that are going along in there, creating all those beautiful flavors going along in there. Take that, add it back into your second runnings that are coming off, spark that all the way out, reduce it a little bit more. You're getting way better efficiency coming off of that. Really fun flavors coming off of the boil. Double mash. Quick uh, going into the double mash. Uh, it's a style that uh, I think it was Czech, but don't quote me on that. Uh, you guys should check it. You should You should totally check it out. Uh, it's, you know, uh, I lost it. Dang it. it. You should check it out. But Great it's, jokes. Uh, a method that was invented because they were being taxed on uh, their mash ton volumes. And so people couldn't make imperial beers. So what they did was they mashed, sparged out, or they mashed, pulled, uh, sparked out, pulled all that water out, pulled the grains out, put new grains in, then took that sparged wort and remashed on top of those new grains. You have extra enzymes going in there. It'll mash out and convert just like the other, uh, just like normal on that. And you're basically doubling the size of your mash and using the same amount of water to do it. That's an incredible way if you are limited on mash ton size to mash more grains. You want to make a 12% beer, but you can only fit enough grain in there to make eight percent cool i'll do that make a six or seven percent beer twice use that same water mash back on top of it pull it out brew it as normal using the double mash method and now you've just severely increased your uh, abv or sugar content your original gravity on that you know a little extra effort but with the same equipment and, and party got a few beers yeah, you're, you're a little behind. Um, we already threw high boil off, right? Double mash, we used that for an American barley wine a while ago. It was really, really good. Um, yeah, it's a great technique. And you can always combine that with party guile to just make smaller beers at the same time. Make one really, really big beer and two really, really small beers. And that's how you can, just with natural brewing techniques, no added sugars, no nothing, get a really nice high ABV beer. Yeah. 
uh, you know, it's a great way to do it. It's a great way, honestly, just to make some more <clears throat> complex beers, uh, really fun ways, you know. Uh, David Saki, have you brewed with mild malt at a high percentage? I've noticed a weird harshness that fades with, fades with time. Yes, we have. Um, we've brewed with mild malt. I'm not a fan. Probably will never brew with again. I got also a grassy, astringent harshness off of it, and I might not have just given it a fair shake, so I probably could figure out what it's used for, but so far I just I didn't like it the first time I brewed with it, and so probably not going to do that again. He hasn't bought it for me to use in the big batch. Um, from what I've used it in personal standpoints, I think there are better malts to use to achieve the same thing. Yeah. If you're trying to make a mild beer, honestly, if you're trying to make a mild beer and you want that nice, big richness and a little bit of that biscuitiness that's in there, Chevalier is going to be so much better and not astringent. Um Gambrinus ESB malt would yep. be incredible for something like that. In all honesty, I could probably make a better mild or use uh, Great Western two row basics easier than doing that. So, uh, Daniel, hey, I've got a question for the week. For styles where some oxidation is expected, do you guys ever mess with controlled oxidation or is it too risky? No, hard to control oxi outside of a cask. Um, usually when oxidation is expected, age is also expected. And so, no, we don't mess with controlled oxidation um, because it's uh, yeah, it's more risky and it's it could be a science that maybe has yet to be figured out, but not something we're willing to try. Um, uh, Nocturnal Brewers, so to wrap it up, use Visco Buster and OptiMash in every batch to get the most. Yes, with ramp mash and slower circulation. All that is great. And I believe that brings us to the end of the questions. If you have yet to give us a thumbs up on this video, do it right now or else. We will be here next Sunday. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, we do this hopefully every Sunday. And uh, you should also f subscribe to this channel, follow us on Instagram. And we also have a TikTok, which we are probably going to start using a little bit more because it's a growing media platform, and I feel like we got to. Cheers, everybody. I'm going to go turn off the stream. If you've got any final questions, then comment them on the video or send them to us over Instagram Messenger. Oh.